Well, hello and welcome to our third week of our Wednesday Bible study on the history of the church called Disruptions. We looked at the first two disruptions we looked at was Pentecost and then the destruction of the temple. Today we're going to turn our attention to another disruption, and that is and the Council of Nicaea, which took place about A.D. 325. It didn't take place about, it did take place A.D. 325. I'm going to start with reading a passage of Scripture. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 1 in the foretelling of the birth of Jesus, uh, the angel Gabriel to Mary. And you'll understand as we get into this why I chose this passage. But basically the Council of Nicaea addresses the issue of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is an essential part of Christian history and uh, essential and um, understanding of Christian doctrine and foundational to who we are as believers. So Luke chapter 1 beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city, city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, for the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David." And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am your servant of the Lord. O oh, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Pray with me briefly. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in this distance to record this Bible study and to study together about the history of your church. We thank you for the fact that you chose to send forth our Son, I mean our Savior, the Lord Jesus, your Son, and uh, he was born of a woman, took on human flesh, lived the perfect life, died a perfect death, rose again so that we may have everlasting life. And we thank you for loving us enough to do it. For the Bible tells us that you loved us enough, Father, to send forth your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we thank you for the history of the church, which has testified to this truth for 2,000 years. And we pray she will continue to testify for many years to come if you choose to delay your return and the establishment of your kingdom. Father, we thank you for your love and for your grace, for it is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Now, as we get started today, we're going to talk about the Council of Nicaea. It took place on May 20th, 2000, excuse me, May 20th, 325. I said 2000. I guess I'm so used to saying 2020. But May 20th, 325 A.D., it uh, took place, there were 230 bishops from all over the Roman world, all over the world of Christendom and the Christian church that came together and gathered in a place called Nicaea. When they gathered together in a place called Nicaea, they had one major issue to discuss and to settle, and that is... Is Jesus Christ the divine Son of God? What is the divinity of Christ? Now, as modern-day Christians, we would say that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. That formula actually comes from another council, a worldwide ecumenical council of the Christian church uh, that took place later, uh, particularly the Council of Chalcedon. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But uh, the idea of his divinity, 100% divine, uh, the Lord Jesus being fully divine, that was settled, that matter was settled it at, um, at Nicaea, and it was primarily settled with reference to the Son uh, of God and the formulation of the Trinity as we understand it today. So we understand God exists as a, as a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. 
The Westminster Shorter Catechism tells us that those three persons of the Godhead are equal in power, glory, and honor. It's a formula that we find laid out in the scriptures that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit equal in power, glory, and honor. Those three persons of the, of the Godhead, but there's only one God, one true God, the God of the Bible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. Deuteronomy 6. And then throughout uh, the entirety of the scriptures, we see God revealing himself to be triune in person. And so we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one God, equal in power, glory, and honor. That's the orthodox, the historical formula of understanding who God is in the Trinity. How did it get to that point? That's the question. How did it get to that point? Well, it got to that point uh, through the Council of Nicaea, 325 on May the 20th. Coming into the Council of Nicaea, there were three primary understandings. We may say two primary schools of thought, but may, maybe three primary understandings for our purposes today of the relationship between God the Son and God the Father in particular. The first has to do with uh, the concept, the idea of emphasizing the unity of the Godhead. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit unifying or emphasizing, excuse me, the unity of the one God. And we could call these the monarchist, and basically their idea was focusing on the unity of the Godhead so much so that they denied the deity of Jesus and the deity of the Holy Spirit. And here's kind of what they thought. There was one God who had appeared in different modes throughout human history, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when you look at the Bible and you say, all right, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. There is one God. The Jewish faith is a monotheistic faith. The Christian faith is a monotheistic faith. One God, right? And so they would say, the people who held to this view back in the day, and some people would still hold to this view today, but the idea is, and it's a heterodox, it's unorthodox, it's not Christian. Basically, simply, in any way, shape, or form, is it, it's not Christian in any way, shape, or form. But the idea is that the Father would appear, uh, that God appeared sometimes as a Father, God appeared sometimes as a Son, and God appeared sometimes as a Spirit. Because they wouldn't deny, right, the fact that the Bible tells us that God exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so they would say that God, the one God, is just appearing in various different modes throughout human history. An offshoot of that is the idea that uh, the son, Jesus, uh, was adopted by God. The human man, Jesus, was adopted by God and then was saturated with divinity or imbued with divine presence. And so there was a man adopt, adopted uh, by God and then uh, was saturated with the divine presence of God. He wasn't fundamentally God. And of course, that's not Christian at all either, because that would, there's a number of reasons why that is. But one is the fact that it says, right, basically that uh, Jesus is a created being and that the Son was a created being. And so one of those views says that uh, God just exists as one and, and appears in different modes throughout human history. One of them says that he adopted into his life a human and then imbued divine presence or saturated that human with divine presence, with divinity. But that's a created being. And so those folks were coming in with one school of thought uh, early on in the Christian church. Remember, 325, I mean, th this is early on in the story of Christian faith. This is early on in the story of Christ uh, of Christian history. We're at 2022, so we're 1,700 years roughly later, all right? So this is early on, and they're still trying to figure this stuff out. Second school of thought was kind of headed up by this guy named Arius, and this became the dominant school of thought. This one and the one I'm going to notice next by a name, a guy named, I, I, I kind of became the orthodox view, but it was championed by a guy named Athanasius. Arius' view was that the Father uh, was not created. So God exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the Father was not created. It's the only person of the Trinity that was not created. Um, but the Son was created by the Father and was begotten by God like all other creatures. Uh, as a result of being begotten by, like all other creatures, he came from the Father. The Father was the only one who existed without being created. The Son was created came into existence just like the Holy Spirit. And he said he was different than other creation, but was a creation nonetheless. This means that the Son does not possess the inner uh, recesses of the divine mind, that as a created being, the Son has got potential for change and even potential for sin and potential to sin. Though he never did sin, he had the potential to sin. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not equal. Now, Arius would not deny that formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he would say they're not equal in substance, power, or glory. Let me give you a, a statement from a guy named Mar uh, Mark Knoll in his book, Turning Points. He's a, a Christian historian, and he wrote these words regarding the views of regarding the views of Arius. This is what he says. Yes, this is his summary statement of Arius's views. Yes, Jesus may have played a special role in all of creation and redemption of the world, but he could not himself be God in the sense that the one God was uniquely divine. There could be only one God, therefore Christ must have been created. Christ, like all of other creation, must be subject to change and even to sin. And Christ, again, like all other created beings, could not have full knowledge of the mind of God. And so that was the view of Arius. And it had a lot of traction. Because the church is still trying to settle this idea of how God has revealed himself to us in his word. How does God exist and how does he reveal himself in his word? And that's the purpose for this council. The third view that I'm going to put forward is the orthodox view. It's the view that the council ultimately said, this is the biblical view. This is the view we're going to hold on to. This is the view we're going to set in stone. And then moving forward, this is going to be the view of the orthodox church. It was championed by a guy named Athanasius. Athanasius later became the bishop of Alexandria. He wasn't the bishop of Alexandria in 325 when he came to the Council of Nicaea, but he held that Jesus Christ is indeed 100% God. And here's his practical reasoning for this. He argued that from a practical standpoint, if Christ wasn't fully God, right? If Jesus wasn't fully God, if the Son uh, the second person of the Trinity wasn't fully divine and equal with the power, equal in power, glory, and honor and substance with his Father. Then he could not bestow life on the repentant and free them from sin. So think about it this way: if sin, as the Bible teaches, Psalm fifty-one talks about this. If sin, when we sin, we sin against God and God alone. We see this in Psalm fifty-one. When David is confessing his sin with Bathsheba and later killing her husband Uriah by putting on the front lines, David confesses that sin and says when he confesses that sin, against you and you only have I sinned. You may also remember from this story of Joseph when Potiphar's wife is trying to get Joseph to lie with her and have a, a sexual affair with her. Joseph says, I can't commit this sin against my, my, my master Potiphar, but more than that, against the Lord because Joseph and David understood, and you understand if you've been convicted of your sin, that ultimately your sin is against a holy and just God. And you realize that the beauty and the wonder of the gospel message that makes you a Christian when you place your faith in Christ is that God loved you enough to bear the burden of your sin, to send forth his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity who took on human flesh and lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, and rose again to conquer death, the conquered death once and for all. That God had chosen to pour out his wrath, the Father, on his own Son. Which means if Jesus is not God, he can't forgive you and me of the sins we've committed against him. His sacrifice isn't large enough. His sacrifice isn't great enough. Now that was Athanasius' argument, and it's an argument that's withheld the, the test of time and withstood the test of time. Because it makes perfect sense, does it? God had to bear the burden of our sin and punish it in himself in order to forgive us of it. It's the only way we can find freedom and forgiveness. And this is Athanasius' argument. He says it takes divine sacrifice to satisfy divine justice. Now, the council agreed with that position. And as a result of that, the council said that God the Son has to be equal with the Father in his divinity. Equal in power, glory, honor, and substance. And so the council met, and what came out of the council to settle this matter is simply four principles that became formalized over the next 70 years after Nicaea, and in the year, beginning of the 5th century, the beginning of the 400s, became the standard orthodox position of the Christian church. And 1,700 years later, roughly, 2025 will be 1700th birthday of Nicaea, the celebration of Nicaea's 1700th birthday. But 
over the last 1700 years has become the bedrock of the Christian faith and the understanding of the divine trinity. These are four principles of Nicaea. Let me give them to you. Number one, that Christ, the Lord Jesus, was very God of very God. That means simply that he was truly God in every way. There's no way, shape, or form that the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is different from the Father, the first person of the Trinity. They are very God of very God, together. Second principle is that Christ, the Lord Jesus, was of one substance, in his divine nature, one substance with the Father, meaning they shared the same substance. They were the same being, right? So there's no way they're different and they're not different because they share the same substance, the same being. And so there's one God, but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equally share the same being. This comes out of the Council of Nicaea. When I told you of Arius earlier, you said, man, you might have said, that's a little weird. And the reason it's weird is because we now, over 1,700 years, understand that the Son, right, is the same substance with the Father. Principle number three is that Christ was begotten, not made. In other words, he's always been there. The second person of the Trinity was always there. He's eternal, just like the first person, just like the third person. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternal. They've always been. God has always existed as one God in three persons. It's always been that case way. It's always going to be that way. When we think about begotten, so I quoted in my prayer, John chapter 3, verse 16. You may be saying, well, help me understand how in John three sixteen it says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, obviously, being a reference to the, the triune God, but in, in this case, the Father, his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in him, the work of the Spirit, works belief and faith in our lives, right? So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all involved in the work of salvation there. Spirit working that. But you may say, well, what does the word begotten mean? Well, the word begotten has to do with relationship, but not with substance, not with being. That's where Arius missed it. That's where the monarchists missed it, right? The idea that they were different or they took on different, that, that God took on different forms throughout history. No, one God eternally father son and holy spirit the son always is always god always will be god bears the same substance begotten meaning in that relationship of the trinity there's a father son and holy spirit they have different functions and different responsibilities and then number four is that christ became human for us men and for our salvation. So Nicaea says, Christ was very God of very God. Christ was of one substance with the Father. Christ was begotten, not made. And then four, that he became human for us men, women and children for our salvation. He took upon himself human flesh. That's what Paul talks about in Philippians 2. That the, the Lord Jesus, the God the Son, who had equality with God, but considered it not something to be grasped or held on to, but rather gave it up and took on human flesh and became obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Therefore, the Father raised him up and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He took on himself human flesh. That's why I read from Luke chapter 1. When Gabriel comes to Mary, he makes it very clear that the child she is going to bear in her womb does not have human origins with reference to a father. Joseph was not physically Jesus' father. The Holy Spirit will come and impregnate you. And so the Spirit will do it. And this is God doing it so that she will bear a child that is 100% God and 100% man. And so it's important for us to understand this was a turning point in the history of the church. Doctrinally speaking, absolutely, you, you can understand that. Foundationally to who we are, right? A turning point when the church comes together and says, we're going to put together. Remember last week we talked about the need to have a, a canon of scripture, a need to have creedal formulas to pass the faith on, a need to have some type of governmental structure to, to preserve unity and to give some uniformity. And now the church is just solidifying that even more by settling this matter of the divinity of Jesus, the deity of Christ. 
and the understanding of the Trinity, which won't find its fully its full um, formulaic expression until later on. But it's all here at Nicaea, getting started, and the deity of Christ is settled once and for all. It's a major turning point doctrinally. It's also a turning point for the life of the Christian Church, uh, politically and socially as well. The Council of Nicaea was called into existence by the emperor Constantine in 325. Now, Constantine is an interesting character uh, in the history of um, humanity, but certainly in the history of the Christian church. Constantine was a a Roman general, a leader. Uh, In 312, he came um, to the throne as a co-emperor with a man named Licinius. Uh, He has some crazy dreams and some visions where he says that God specifically came to him and revealed himself to him and we believe his testimony there in 324 he overcame Licinius to become the sole emperor of Rome in 325 he calls the bishops together to settle this matter of the divinity of Christ but before we get too excited about Constantine who later is baptized on his deathbed but has a great affiliation with Christianity and we believe he was a Christian he was baptized on his deathbed as he neared the end of his life. But before we get too excited about him, we have to understand that his motives weren't, ex- weren't exclusively religious and pure. Right? He didn't just say, all right, you guys have got this matter to settle uh, within the context of the Christian church, so let's figure out a way to settle it. Now, this is the Roman emperor calling together the bishops of the church to settle this matter. Why would he do that? Well, after 300 years of roughly 300 years of persecution by the Roman Empire, The last great persecution of the church uh, in this period came under Diocletian, uh, the Roman emperor, at the beginning of the 4th century, 300s, or right at the beginning of the 300s. Diocletian was concerned about the explosion and the growth of the Christian church. There's an exponential growth of the Christian church throughout history. It's still going on in our world today. We just don't see it in the West as much, but there's an exponential growth. And Diocletian was concerned about that. So his idea was, let's suppress it. He was following the lead of all of those emperors before him. Let's suppress the Christian church. And if we suppress the Christian church, it'll stop. Well, there are governments around the world, even today, understanding that you can't suppress the growth of the Christian church. She will often flourish in the midst of oppression and suppression. And so Constantine said, you know what, let's harness the power. He was a believer, we believe. He came to faith and said, all right, let's harness the power of the Christian faith to unify the Roman Empire. Let's, let's see if we can't make, bring cultural unity and cultural change as a result of the Christian faith. And so he brought these bishops together to a large degree to say, all right, you guys quit fighting over these things. Settle your beliefs. Settle what the Bible teaches us so that we can move forward and we can unify the empire and we won't have all this religious um, sectarianism and all that stuff. We'll come together and we'll be unified. In fact, he says that, again, back to Mark Knoll's point, uh, he says that in, uh, in his letter that he writes to call the um, bishops together. This is what he says. It's my design is first to bring the diverse judgments found by all nations respecting the deity to a condition, as it were, of settled uniformity. Now let me give you simply, that means to clarify the doctrine for the sake of the church. But then he says this, second, to restore a healthy tone to the system of the world than suffering under the power of grievous disease. The disease is religious strife for the sake of the empire. Let's bring healing for the suffering of the world that is now suffering under the grievous disease of brokenness and division. And so he wants to unite everybody. He wants to unite everybody. Now this is a blessing for us because he was providentially put in a place by God to be able to do this as the Roman Empire. Came to faith, had a conversion experience, uh, brings everybody together, right? And they come together and they're in a free moment, an opportunity. They settle down this very basic question of who is Jesus and what is his divinity? And how is the divinity of Christ and the divinity of the Son of God connected to the divinity of the Father, right? And so it's a really helpful thing and we're very gracious for it. 1,700 years later, we're still standing on this foundation as a, as, a, as a tradition of the church and the understanding of the orthodox of the church. But there are always challenges that stem from any blessing, correct? We understand that. And so there's, there are challenges that are going to stem from this connection between the, 
the, the empire and the church brought unity of, of doctrine. It also brought unity of, uh, eventually, unity of, uh, of culture and faith. It started what we know as the age of Christendom. It began Christendom. Christendom is something that has been collapsing over the last 300 years. We'll get to that in time. But it began Christendom. Christendom no longer exists, in my opinion. That's a sad thing. But here's some, some challenges, some issues that came as a result of this. Athanasius, the great hero of Nicaea, as a result of the, un, the, the connection between the empire and the church, found himself over the next, 70, you know, next 25, 30 years of his life, uh, found himself in exile a number of times, banished a number of times, because different emperors would rise, and Athanasius and bishops in the church were always subject to the, empire, the emperor's particular view. So there were emperors who would, who would rise up and, and, and become entrenched in power and they would hold the Arius's view and so they would kick Athanasius out because he was the champion of the orthodox view and so there are issues where believers in Christ were still persecuted for holding to the orthodox view and they were subject to the whims of the emperor but that's not the big issue right? so here's the big big two big things to take away number one there's a question of the relationship between the civil government and the church What's the, what's the relationship now that they've been closely connected between the civil government, the empire, and the church? This is a question that we're still trying to address, and we're still trying to answer. And it's interesting that the proponents of, of different views of the Trinity actually used those views of the Trinity to understand that relationship. So there were some who would say, uh, the monarchist or the Arians would say that everyone is subject to the Father. The Father is eternal, and the Son, therefore, is subject to the Father because he was created. And so his idea would be that the government would be over and above the church. Two separate institutions, but the church would be subject because the church is the kingdom of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's subject to the government. And so that's why Athanasius was kicked out. Then there were uh, those that said no, right? If the, the, the Orthodox people pushed back on that completely and totally that came out of Nicaea and said, listen, no, they're two separate entities, the kingdom of, uh, of the civil authority and the kingdom of the, the son, the church, and they're equal, right? And so there's freedom. And so the church must have freedom to worship. The first church must have freedom to, to offer prayers. The church must have freedom to participate in the sacraments and do discipline. The church must have freedom to develop its doctrine and understanding based on the teachings of the Bible. And so while they're, they're, they're two different kingdoms, they're, they're there, but they're equal and there must be separate and there must be freedom for the church to exercise her authority. And so the question still remains. It's a question we're still trying to settle. It's been going on. And you've got to remember, nothing ever happens in a vacuum. So you can look at this world around us today and say, I don't understand all this. Well, that goes way back, 1,700 years, to where they're having this conversation because there was a connection at Nicaea, uh, 324, 325, with the empire and the church. Right? And so this is a, a question that's based on the understandings of the Trinity. It's, it's, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds of it, but it's just a fascinating thing. And so there's this, this ongoing debate that has to come out now that there's a connection between the church and the empire. Prior to that, it was clear, right? The church existed on her own, right? So God had her there when she was being persecuted. Well, we're not connected at all. But now we've got to figure out this relationship between the church and the state. Is the church subject to the state, or are they free and independent of one another? Maybe having different roles, working together, but freedom. Then you've got this question of the rise of Christendom and the confluence of political, social, religion, religious ideals and desires. And so this is probably the second great issue that's come out of this, is that the rise of Christendom and the confluence of political, social, and religious ideals. So think about it this way. For three centuries, the church was persecuted. That's gone. Now Constantine is a Christian and brought the church together, connected the, the, the empire and the church, and the imperial rule now has something to do with the church. Now what that relationship is has got to be settled. It will be settled over time to some degree. But the emperor, if the emperor could help settle, think about this, if the emperor could help settle 
doctrinal disputes, if that was allowed, then it was also allowed to, for people to have in their imaginations a world in which worldly order, success, wealth, stability for the empire were church concerns as well. And so there became this confluence between the sole mission of the church, worship of God, glorify God and enjoy Him forever, testify to the gospel and stand on the word of truth. And now the, the kingdom of the world comes in and says, all right, but, but our success in our mission, maybe it's tied to the stability of the world in which we live. Maybe it's tied to the prosperity of the economic system. Maybe it's tied to order within the, the society. Maybe it's tied to the success of the empire in which we live. You see? Now you got this connection. And the church has been wrestling with this to some degree for the last 1,700 years and is still wrestling with it today. And so this is kind of the genesis, the beginning of all of those conversations in Nicaea 325. It's why it's such an important point in disruption of the world, but also in the history of the church. Because now we start, oh, man, there's one of, we got something to stand upon. And now we got some freedom to stand upon it and don't have to worry about persecution. But now, does that freedom come at cost? And at what cost does that freedom come? And how do we work those two things out? Great questions that will be answered in the weeks to come, but also in the years to come, and still to be answered in the years to come from even where we sit today. And so one of the things that develops in the next 150 years is this movement toward monasticism where there are some who are saying we've got to step out away from the world, away from the empire, to hold fast to the doctrine, to keep the worship of the church pure and the doctrines of the church pure. And we'll start to see more and more of an influence in the monastic moments and one of the, in the monastic growth. And we have some tremendous theological developments. And guess what? The Protestant Reformation comes from that monastic group and Martin Luther as he was a monk himself. Let me get in here today and just challenge you with the Nicene Creed. I think it's in my book right here. Uh, if I can find it, uh, the Nicene Creed, and uh, if not, I'll pull one out of the, the hymnal. Uh, but um, the Nicene Creed, let me get it right quick. Got one right here. And I'll end with this. Let me just read it to you. This is the creed that comes out of the Council of Nicaea that speaks to the very truth of God. I believe in one God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and our apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I believe in Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equal in power, glory, and honor. That's the most wonderful thing that comes out of Nicaea, that beautiful doctrinal statement upon which we stand that tells us our God is relational, our God loves us, our God is eternal, and our God is pursuing his people. You guys have a great day. God bless you. I'll see you next week.